Hi, my name is Chris Sikora, and I'm presenting to you today an invention for my project for our energy course. And what it stems from is early in the, a couple weeks ago actually, we had a, a course discussion. I, of course, watched it on the internet. And it was with regards to wind power as well as um, solar power and what do we do with it once you get it. And someone had mentioned batteries. And I just thought to myself, the first thing I think of is my cell phone and cell phone, my cell phone battery I have to change out just around, around two years. And they're rather expensive. And in this case, you would need a very large battery or a series of batteries to uh, control or to gather enough energy for, to run a household. Well, they're also, um, actually Honda claims that their batteries last about eight to ten years, which is phenomenal but yet they still are expensive and also as I read an article on CNBC or I, I'm sorry MSNBC that um, they do create some hazardous waste during the manufacturing process as well as their disposal if, especially if they're not disposed of properly so there can be some issues with batteries and my idea was to come up with some goals for a project to develop a new invention that would be first of all safe environmentally friendly has a longer lifespan than batteries and relatively inexpensive with low maintenance. And what I thought of was um, RTG technology, radioisotope thermoelectric generators. If you, you can see in the image there to the right, that is actually an ingot of uh, plutonium that was actually put into the Cassini space probe. and it's very hot that's why it's red actually and those get sent out in outer space with these space probes in the unit that you see up there on the screen and they heat these little thermoelectric generators those are those little black uh, wafers that you see there and they absorb electricity and convert the, I should say they absorb the heat and they convert it to electricity to run the, uh, the spacecraft so I thought, well, how can we apply this somehow without using the nuclear material? And so I had to do some research on this. My father and I actually done a little project uh, over a year ago with uh, these devices, so I knew a little bit about them to begin with. But what they're comprised of, basically, is they are of little pellets of bismuth telluride, and they're sandwiched between a metallic ceramic substrate. They're not very big. These are like two by two inches. And if we peel off the uh, substrate, you'll see the these are these pellets are basically P and N type pellets. Semiconductors are doped, and essentially what they do is there's um they're all wired together through the substrate, and then you have the poles coming out, positive and negative, that uh, for either inputting electricity or taking it out, and inside the substrate that also has all the wiring for the uh, the PNN type junctions. Now what you get out of these things is uh, you have the Peltier effect first of all that could be utilized and what this does is through electrical input it actually chills one side of the of a substrate of the substrate and the other side gets hot. And so this is actually used um, inside for example Dell computers their higher end XPS systems for video gaming they cool the processors using this technique. Now you could reverse this. You could actually apply heat and cold to the, the different sides and extract or generate electricity from this. And these are the exact same components. So if we look at the performance specifications, this was taken offline from Telerex, a company out in Detroit, Michigan, who actually develops these for various applications, some of which are used in automotive. And I just took off their website. They have these 2x2 two two inch wafers capable of outputting about 1.2 amps, uh, 4.8 volts at uh, 5.7 watts. Now the temperatures, they have to vary on both sides, so you're looking at the hot side should be around 120 degrees to about the maximum of 347 degrees. That uh, starts to get close to its melting point, but uh, that's about 175 degrees Celsius. 
And then the cool side, anything less than 120 degrees, and these could get very cool if you apply electricity to them. We're talking freezing temperatures. As you can see here on the little chart, you can, um, the further those two sides get apart in temperature, the higher the output and power. So how best can you utilize this device? Uh, I, I was fascinated early on by these, but um, in my research, I actually put together on my CAD system, I designed a unit, I call it the Clausius one named after the, uh, you might call him the father of the second law of thermodynamics, um, Rudolf Clausius, physicist from Germany back uh, in 1850, between 1850 and 1860, actually uh, honed the concepts of entropy, which entropy is the it can be defined as kind of the scrap or the wasted um, electricity or energy that doesn't do work. And so I call it the entropic energy harvester because it's through different methods trying I'm trying to squeeze all that energy out what I can from this unit. And it would be actually utilizing some electricity that would be provided from solar or wind power. So the concept, Entropic Energy Harvester, uses cogeneration. Hot water heater would act as. could act as a supplemental heat exchanger for your furnace during the winter. An air conditioner during the summer. Uh, supplemental refrigeration for your refrigerator so you weren't not using as much electricity during the summer. And also a general pur purpose generator as well as an emergency generator. The Clausius One is a thermoelectric harvesting device. It's built with three layers, thin walls, metal, and the inner core is going to basically, it's a big bucket uh, or drum that holds about 40 gallons of water. And then there's a secondary core that holds uh, some additional water, and you'll see how that all works. So let's take a look at this. Let's strip this down to the very bottom. And the first thing we see is the central water core. This is the 40 gallon tank that I was talking about earlier. This will hold the water. And at the bottom of it, there's a heating element. And that heating element would be powered by the solar panels or wind generator you would have on your house. Then you'd have this thermoelectric wafers, a whole array of them, 260 of total on this one that I designed into. And those would require heat sinks, another 260, to cool them. Because and with these wafers, you have to keep them hot and cold. Hot stays hot, cold stays cold, in order to generate peak or optimum power. Then we'd have to put some insulation in between all that to protect the inside core from the outside core because they are varying temperatures. And then the secondary water core would be uh, uh, surrounding that whole area that you saw earlier, and that this would be chilling those heat sinks. And then finally, we have the water and control valves. These would be directional control valves, solenoid controlled, to basically get the water where you need it. And then the outer shell, which is just, it could be made out of a polymer, something lightweight. Okay, during the winter, this is how I theorize it would operate. The water from your water coming into your house would basically funnel into it through the base, through, through the bottom up to the top and fill the chamber, the uh, inner core. Then the solar or wind energy converted into electricity would power this little device, the little heating element at the bottom, warming the water to temperatures around 300 degrees. And then the water would be flowing into the uh, surrounding area in the secondary core that would chill the heat sinks. And with this, I figured we might be able to generate around 1.5 kilowatts, just under that, at prime temperatures. Now the excess hot water can be used for general household needs. You could use it for uh, bathing or kitchen use. Uh, it also acts as the water that would go into the heat exchanger, into the furnace to warm your house. And let's take a look at that. Here's a cross-sectional view of a, of a house. And you can see the furnace at the bottom and the water's going into a little heat, ex heat exchanger, as well as to the different, uh, the sink and the bathtub. And the little orange 
lines there are indicating the actual wind or the air coming out of the furnace that's hot to heat your home and finally the yellow arrow is indicating the supplemental electricity that could power different appliances in your home I have a pointing to it a refrigerator I might not be able to power a, a larger refrigerator but a smaller one I could definitely power here's a little cut section view, uh, isometric view actually, of the unit alongside of the furnace and you can see the uh, heat exchanger that it's plugged into next to it. And basically what you have here, there's the harvester that's you're looking in the inside, it's cut through, and then the furnace and then the heat exchanger. And you have the hot water coming out of the harvester into the heat exchanger and then the air just blows through the base and comes up through the top very similar to how like a, a humidifier that would attach to a furnace would work so it could be an aftermarket unit you don't have to purchase anything new uh, any new furnace or anything like that you just could uh, cut a hole in the side and attach this unit the summer everything's just reversed instead of the heating element working down the bottom the actual uh, wafers act as heating elements on the outside but yet remember they changed to cold on the inside so they would actually be chilling the water in the 40 gallon tank and then they'd be heating up the water in the outer barrier there and so you'd still have hot water if necessary and you would have cold water that could be cycled through the exchanger in your furnace to cool the house so if we look at that you can see it going to the exchanger providing air conditioning and then also perhaps you could attach another exchange unit into the refrigerator to chill it. Emergency operation, the event that there's a some sort of emergency, you don't have electrical power, there's no sunlight, and there's no wind. Uh, you could actually have it hooked up to your gas line permanently or else propane, and it just work as an ordinary hot water heater by flame um, basically heating up the water in the, in the central tank and then of course the water flowing through on the outside would be cold and you would have yourself uh, electrical energy so it's a little generator the advantages to this um, are pretty clear I think it's clean it's efficient it's easy to install well that's how I hope it would be it's uh, relatively safe as long as it's designed correctly it, temperature is above 300 degrees it might get a little some pressure issues there but uh, that could all be uh, controlled with relief valves and things like that it's safe uh, it should be relatively inexpensive the prototype I'm costing it out right now if I were to make a full prototype it, we're talking over eleven thousand dollars because the high performance thermoelectric units are rather expensive I did find some lesser expensive ones for around two dollars and fifty cents versus the seventy dollars for the high efficiency ones um, of course if you were to mass produce that they'd be a lot cheaper and it's virtually silent there's really no moving parts in this low maintenance where I get that is basically if we look at the Voyager 1 spacecraft launch with an RTG in it back in 1977 it's still operational so they these uh, thermoelectric devices do last a long time. They uh, figure though it's about at 80 percent of what it was back in 1977 so that's still pretty darn good. And then we're talking about cogeneration here, multitasking, acts as a furnace, a hot water heater, air conditioner, supplemental general purpose power generation, and uh, emergency generator. Some of the disadvantages I could think of, I know there's more out there, require solar and wind components. Uh, these are not cheap by any means yet this day and age. Uh, hopefully they will we'll start to see the prices go down then maybe something like my device would be financially viable. Uh, maybe it won't be as effective as I thought. On paper some of it looks pretty good. I might be missing something and it uh, and then finally there's always better technology coming out. This could be obsolete tomorrow. It could, be, it could already be obsolete. In conclusion, even though the uh, Clausius looks good on paper, um, I'm still not convinced it's going to be the end-all be-all here. It's a, it's a multitasking solution, which I think that's one of the biggest advantages. 
And if it does turn out to be effective, um, it's still not the key to our nation's energy needs, but it is a step in the dire right direction. I'd like to thank you all for watching the presentation. I hope you enjoyed it. Have a very nice holiday. And thank you very much.